Welcome to the Academy of Esports Podcast. I am your host, James O'Hagan. I'm still Dr. O'Hagan. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I'm like, what? Where did that come from? I'm still working on that. Uh, we are here with Dr. Tanisha Singleton. Dr. Singleton, thank you for being a guest today in the Academy of Esports. No problem. Thank you for having me. I'm sure you are a doctor of something. I'm working on it. Everything but dissertation. It's all it's all there. Your ABD, all but dissertation. All but dissertation. Yeah. Well, Dr. Singleton has completed her uh, PhD. Uh, she is a media psychologist, creative strategist, and sports entertainment professional with an expertise in fan engagement, integrated marketing, and digital communication. But I think the thing that, that really kind of piqued my interest, uh, Dr. Singleton, was your involvement with the uh, Black Girl Hockey Club because if there's probably, Scholastic Esports is right up there with misunderstood and things that maybe are not always, uh, I guess, presented well to people. Hockey in this country is definitely something that uh, when people think African American community, they don't think hockey at all, mm-hmm. and, and and they don't think a lot of girl hockey either. Even though in the northern United States, we we have a number of female teams, yeah. so I want to make sure that we talk about that. But before we get going on that, we're changing up formats here a little bit with the Academy of Esports. We're gonna we're gonna start off with some get to know you type of questions. Okay, so. Mm-hmm. First, the first question. Now, I don't want you to say hockey. You know, I guess you could say hockey to this one, but what is a game? Doesn't have to be a video game. It stands out as having been important to you at some point in your life, and maybe why was that experience meaningful? Oh, there's there's two that immediately come to mind, and one was the first time I went to see professional wrestling live. I was probably about eight or nine years old. I'll call that a game. And mm-hmm. old school, like WWF, before they, you know, had to get the F out and put in the E. But it was at like the Orange Pavilion in San Bernardino, California. And I was like nine years old. Security was loose back then. You know, this mm-hmm. is like maybe 92, 91. You buy a ticket and I didn't sit. You know, it's almost like a baseball game. You go, you don't sit where your actual seat is. You just kind of like loom around until somebody kicks you out. And so mm-hmm. that's what I did. And as soon as I entered the building, I was like, Psh, I just out and just ran around to the front row, interacting with other fans and the wrestlers. And just, it's just such a larger than life experience. That was amazing. And uh, it, I was bit instantly because I, I still am a, a pro wrestling fan. Um, the second one I would say is actually uh, any Mike Tyson fight from the early 90s, uh, late 80s, because my parents, big sports fans, big combat sports fans, boxing primarily, and especially that was the heavyweight heyday, like of mm-hmm. the boxing industry, right? And so my parents were kind of like the the fight house. So all their friends would come over and watch the pay-per-views, you know what I mean? And like bring food, drinks and all that stuff. And so I was still a little kid, but I was just fascinated that like, that was the first time I really saw it. I was like, okay, there's one event, it's going on live, but it's bringing everyone together. Everyone's having a good time and talking about this one singular thing that's going on. Mm-hmm. And I remember putting my brother's, my, my big brother, I put his tube socks like on my hands as like boxing gloves and I hung up a pillow from like the closet rod and started punching it because I saw that's what they were doing on the TV. So all my parents, old friends were like, oh, go Tony, go, yeah, you got it, blah, blah, blah. And so I was just like, oh, that's cool. And so, and hey, I have that boxing canvas Oh yeah. Me. And I'm still a, a big combat sports fan and boxing fan. So, but those were two early inductions where I got bit by the sports bug period and have not turned away, <laughs> not looked back since. The the WCW NWO thing for me was that yeah. Monday Nitro. That was my yeah. thing. And the then, Wars on Monday. Remember when yeah. Rodman came right after they won the title. Oh, there's there was all kinds of Monday night, yeah, because you also had uh, Monday Raw, Raw. yeah, mm-hmm. and that was the, that was when uh, Degeneration X was doing their stuff, and yeah, and now there's a and now there's AEW, which is a throwback to the Attitude Area, and when I saw they had Chris Jericho, I'm like, I'm in, <laughs> I am in on Chris Jericho because Chris hey. Jericho is one of my favorites of all time. They've got a hell of a lot more to Jake the Snake Roberts. <laughs> They've got yeah. like a oh, lot of gosh. throwbacks. 
you know, Dusty Rhodes' son, uh, Cody Rhodes, um, and his brother, you know, started this. Um, it's co-owned and invested by the Jackville, the Jacksonville Jaguars owner, Tony Khan. So it's bringing back that whole Turner TNT versus WWE slash F era. And I, it's a great time to be a pro wrestling fan again because I took a few years off because I was like, ugh. But this is great. It's great. And it's very much more uh, inclusive. And they've been doing a hell of a job at not only just supporting their their talent as like individual athletes and individual humans with lives outside of it, where it's not as toxic as some of these industries have tended to been in the past. Hmm. Well, unfortunately, this is not the wrestling podcast, though. <laughs> I'm I will say this. I'm posting this. <laughs> my, friend, my friend Jay Blackman, who is a uh, technology uh, coordinator in Northwest Indiana, he's going to be like, no, no, let's keep on this. He's, <laughs> he's going to be all about this. Next but, time. Uh, yeah, but uh, just again, warm up questions. Totally eccentric, or maybe it's quite traditional. What is your superpower? That thing that you do better than most people? Or what do you wish you could do? Oh. I wish I could crack in between my shoulder blades. That it's always there's that one spot that I just can't ever get. But that's what I wish I could do. Like I could have the ability to just like crack any joint that needs to get for relief. Um, <laughs> but my superpower that I actually can do, yeah. um, I think I'm good at making anybody, almost anybody. I'm good at making people I work with feel special, mm. feel val- feel valued, feel like they're contributing and can talk to a lot of different types of people from, you know, you have computer people, you have introverts, extroverts, gamers, jocks, nerds, band musicians. I am all of those things. And so I'm pretty eclectic and I feel I'm very proud of the fact that I have such a multidisciplinary and diverse group of friends and I can mm. talk to and feel comfortable and acknowledge the differences in personality from all from any type of personality too. So I think that's something that I I pride I pride myself on that, and I do that. I'm able to do that in my work. I'm able to do that as a good friend, and yeah, I'll give myself some flowers for that. I, I will say though, your your ability to crack in between your shoulder blades. I can't imagine you walking the halls of. Uh, you know, Professor X's school for gifted children and like, I can shoot fire from my hands. I can shoot lasers from my eyes. I can crack my shoulder blades. <laughs> hey, I am always looking for like those chairs that are just the right length and then I'll just like, yes. and do that. Like I do that religiously when I find a good I chair. am with you. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I am with you a hundred percent on that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, name that one song. Whenever it hits your speakers, you're going to sing along to. Fantasy by Earth, Land, and Fire is my favorite song of all time. Saw them in concert like 10 years ago. Aaron Neville opened at the Nokia in wow. downtown LA. And I was like, me and my girlfriends that were there, we were the youngest people there. We were probably like 27 at the time. And so people were like, no, the Usher concert's over there. We're like, no, man, we're here for <laughs> Earth, Land, and Fire, dude. And so they're like, oh, God. And I'm sure we ruined it for a lot of people. But I had a great time and stood on the chair singing every word to Fantasy. It, it is more than September, folks. The, the, the Earth, Wind, and Fire is much more than September. Get the anthology. I get so upset when people are like, oh, yeah, the Boogie Wonderland people. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I get offended. All right. And, and I think this starts to lead us into part of our conversation, into the depths of our conversation. What is one thing about your field that surprises people when they first hear about it? So, again, media psychologist, right? Yep. You know, you're involved with you, you, you're you're heavily involved in that and content creation. But there's got to be something that just people hear and they just go, oh, my gosh, you have to deal with that. Um, I think that what people are most surprised of when I tell them kind of every all the hats that I wear is that they're the most shocked when I say I'm, I'm a professor mm-hmm. because. For some reason, maybe it's just a stigma or something about academia, and I'm, I'm sure we'll get into this in, in terms of like education in general, but there's this stigma that, I don't know, professors are just all dry and just dull, and you can't have a personality or like wrestling or wear a Jill Scott and Chill t-shirt or, or like, you know, pro pro wrestling or I think that call your superpower getting your back cracked like it's there's just for some reason we're like oh my god like 
I didn't, wow, you're a professor? Like you're a professional, you're an entrepreneur, like you're this, you're that. I'm like, yeah, just because you have a PhD doesn't mean your spirit has to get surgically removed. So mm-hmm. when I say I, uh, you know, I got, I, I'm, a, I'm a doctor, I have my PhD and I do all of these things and in the media space and beyond and working with nonprofits, people are just more surprised that my personality and character afforded me that opportunity, you know, or that I was still able to do that, you know, in spite of all the stigmas and institutional narratives about what a blank looks like, I combat and dismantle each and every one of those. And I take pride in doing that because it's something for me as a black female growing up in Riverside, California, uh, there was not a lot of representation in all of these different fields. And I've said this, I've said this in a few other uh, media interviews and stuff, but, but in case some of your audience may not have heard, I, I mentioned while getting my dissertation or PhD is 22 years, right? So K through 12 undergrad, my master's, finishing my PhD, 22 years of education in total. Mm-hmm. I realized last summer while just thinking about everything happening, you know, with the, the murders and BLM and COVID and everything, and you get a lot of downtime and reflection. And in doing so, I realized out of those 22 years, I only had three black teachers my entire life. Really? Three. I had Miss Hill. Shout out, Gloria, Miss Hill, Rubido High School. She was my avid teacher, my college prep teacher. And then I had Dr. Trisha Rose, who taught hip hop and culture, excuse me, at UC Santa Cruz, and who also hosts an amazing podcast called The Tightrope that she co-hosts with Cornell West. And then I had the legendary uh, Dr. Angela Davis, because she's emeritus at UC Santa Cruz as well. And I oh, didn't wow. know what she was going to be teaching. She just, you know, as she can, should just be able to walk in a building. And was like, all right, class is in session. And I was like, ah! like freaking out. And I was just like, you had Angela Davis. She was teaching, it was um, a black women feminism and history course. And it was a small lecture, maybe 30 students. And, it, you know, on the syllabus, it just says like lecturer. Like we didn't know who was going to mm-hmm. be teaching this rotating thing. And then in comes, and I was like, oh. so yeah, those were my three, pivotal three, but that's it. And in recognizing that in hindsight, what part did that play in maybe some stigmas or roles or narratives that I subconsciously play? How did, what was I taught? Yeah. Why was I taught that, right? And then it made me think extra like, yo, why? Cause a lot of people, especially in academia, when I said I wanted to study sports and entertainment and fandom, you know, at a doctoral level, scratched a lot of heads, right? People were like, why that's interesting. But <laughs> I realized in hindsight, I was like, well, you know what? Sports and entertainment has been the only space I could go to regularly to find someone who looks like me succeed and praised. Mm. Where else outside of sports, music, and entertainment do we see black people continually praised and celebrated for their contributions, for their value? I, it, it's, it, it's sad yeah. that, that, that you know, it was it was what Dr. Dre, who was the first billionaire musician. And then, of course, Jay-Z and now Rihanna. Right. You know, right. first billionaire. But that's that's three out of yeah. how many billionaires on the planet, you know. Right. And, and, and where's the one where's the one who's doing it not in the field you're talking about? That's my point. And yeah. it's like. There was, I'm sure, I don't know who originally said this phrase, but it came out a lot during the riots of last summer and the protests. But the the line where it goes, um, I wish America loved black people the way they love black culture. And it's very, very true. And so that's a very long winded answer to what is surprising um, or what surprises most folks. And that's that is that I can, you can be eclectic, diverse, of color passionate about sports, still have personality, love laughs and and spirit and still be professional because it breaks down every single one of those. Oh, I, I didn't know you could do that and still be considered, you know, blank. Oh, I didn't know you could look like this or a professor could do that or look like that. And I was like, well, what did you think they looked like? You know? Mm -hmm. So it just starts to completely shred to pieces these old institutional narratives and constructs about like what a blank is. And I 
I think that's still surprising to some folks, at least when they get introduced to me. Well, let, let me ask you this, because I think we need to qualify this again. It was a Ph.D. in media. Psycho- is it media psychology? Did I say yes. that right? Mm-hmm. So let's qualify. What, what does that mean? Because I say instructional technology to people and they're like, OK, so what computers that learn or what? No, 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 no. But what does it mean for media psychology? It's concentrating totally on the human experience. So looking at the usage relationships and the meaning that people draw with any type of media and or technology. So when you can start to look at the patterns between like media consumption and human behavior, right? What you put in, how does that influence what you put out? How can I, how can understanding people first? Because we're all in the people business. It doesn't matter if you're making Charmin or keyboards or an app or anything or sporting event, a campaign. Media, we are selling and talking to other people. For some reason, that gets forgotten somehow in the ethos of all the zeros and ones and spreadsheets that people make. But each one of those values represents a person. So it behooves us to understand the functions and dynamics of people. What motivates us? What encourages us? How is meaning made? All this fake news stuff and algorithms now and racist algorithms and all these different types of things. And so it's looking at all of those different touch points of media, content and technology and seeing how it impacts the human experience. And so there's a very strong social component to that where you can look at it for a social change perspective. That hashtag tech for good is is always Um, is always pretty prominent in showing a bunch of different things. So this also includes the immersive space. We're looking at VR projects where we are creating a story that you can immerse yourself in to, for persuasive elements so that the user can put themselves in a different perspective, alternative of their own, take it off and leave with a new perspective. I've heard of something like that where I think it was, they were trying to recreate Jim Crow South and a VR experience built around Jim Crow experiences of the South, because, again, we can talk about what that's like. But that but a a student sitting in a classroom or or a parent or a grandparent trying to explain to a child what it's like, even though they may they may you can talk about it. It's still not living. it. It's still not feeling it. It's still not the emotions of it. The the hearing the the hiss of the voice or hearing you know, yeah. those kind of things. That's that's powerful what you're saying. Yeah, there's a lot of that. And so and that could be traditional, digital, hybrid, mixed, you know, or, or fully immersive. There's there's another company called Crux that I, I work with um, doing culture and communications. And it's a black woman led uh, worker cooperative um, dedicated to black creatives in the XR space. And one of our projects has been at Tribeca and then also the VR awards and nominated for tech for social change because of a project called POV, which stands for points of view, which is a sci-fi VR project. It's a whole series actually about maybe six episodes where the whole intent is to look at, um, looking at artificial intelligent intelligence and drone technology. So you can start to see how, underserved and marginalized black communities and communities of color period are targets to these predictive policing and things like that. And so through this narrative, through the script, how users can now start to, like you said, experience it from a different perspective, because yes, just reading about it, nah, you can forget, but feeling it. I'm getting, not that person. Yeah. Getting it. goosebumps, feeling it. So it's that multi-sensory experience. And so media psychology, it's open enough where it relates to not only medical, social change, technology, traditional marketing, any of those things. And I, you know, am using this from the sports entertainment perspective of being able to impact this space for community good, to increase fan engagement, to stimulate some new brand experiences that are dope, and just to really amplify the game in a way that serves everyone for all stakeholders, because athletes have been taken advantage of Fans have been withheld, so on and so forth. So looking at it from, it's it's totally multidisciplinary and, and and can touch a lot of different experiences. So I hope that helped in kind of clarifying or providing some media psych 101. Well, it does. And then, of course, it makes me want to go down another rabbit hole because, oh. well, okay, I want to touch on this for just a second. And, and 
This this might actually fit into this question of what is one of the main challenges you see right now in esports and gaming. Um, what you're seeing, you know, examples of, of ways to tackle it. But right now, for me, the thing that I'm seeing is the NIL. For those of you who yeah. don't name know what that is, that's name, image, likeness. The NCAA basically told 18 year olds, yes, you may now go out and get yourself paid for your name, for your image, for your likeness, where before you couldn't do that. You couldn't take any money. But now we're starting to see, too, just how that can be weaponized, not just by kids, because that can be used as a, as a leverage, but also now some college programs are starting to figure out, especially at the, at the high levels, like BYU just had a uh, person come in and say, hey, we're going to pay for all of your non-scholarship football players. We're going to pay all their scholarships. We're going to pay for them to go to college. And somebody said, well, wait a second, when is Nick Saban going to figure this out and go from having 85 players to 150 players of kids he's just going to bank and just say, yep, yeah, come to Alabama. We're going to put you on the walk on squad. And th- yep. there uh, again, I'm going down a rabbit hole right now with this. But I feel like the NIL was if not, it wasn't caused by. But I think the conversation the NCAA started to have around esports yeah. And realizing there were kids already making tons of money and there was going to be no way that in the future they were going to be able to monitor all that because there are going to be football players who are streaming. There's going to be basketball players who are streaming. What are you going to tell them they can't play? Because now exactly. what? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, there's that. And there's, you know, and this is predominantly for the the sports that are, or at least the conversation has always been prompted by the predominant sports that earn the university money that the students were never able to stay a nickel from football basketball Mm -hmm. we're not hearing a lot about golfers we're not hearing a lot about the swim team or the lacrosse team but this is these are about the money the the money generating sports football basketball and who predominantly plays football and basketball in this country african americans Mm -hmm. black men and women and so many horrid stories i have heard from athletes still having to ask for money from their parents, still being broke, still not have, and sports unfortunately has always been looked at as a way out for a lot of these kids. So they have had the pressures put on them in early teen, damn peewee probably, right? About I need to do this as a way to support my family, to mm-hmm. take them out, right? And, and be of service. And so having to think about that type of domestic pressure put on a teenager is is enormous and so there's always been those um you know the comparisons and to you know slavery and things like that because of like oh look we own you and you don't get anything yeah thanks for giving us you know billions of dollars every year and putting your bodies literally on the line um and then then nothing um so this is you know directly in response to that but it's one of those things like you can never have anything nice because like per your point they will find a way to get theirs as well um, and that's just always going to be, I think, the case for when it comes to corporate corporatizing all of this stuff, which case in point, education has been, because if we're talking about the, the amount of revenue that's being generated from all of this stuff from athletic departments, then we're, we're literally talking about finance finances as opposed to learning, which I thought was the point of, of, you know, of education and higher learning, especially at that level. Well, and if anybody needs an example of just those kind of pressures that uh, Dr. Singleton is talking about, if you have not watched The Last Dance, it goes into depths about what Scottie Pippen went through. Scottie Pippen actually took a very bad contract early in his career, but it was solid money that gave him gener- his family wealth in the short. Because, again, there was nothing guaranteed. I think even Jerry Reinsdorf, who is the owner of the Bulls, uh, even said in that he 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 was the owner of the Bulls and said, look, Scotty, you don't have to take this contract. It's This is not a good deal. And Scotty still took it anyway. The know. immediacy. Yeah, you know, and you can't pay your electric bill on a promise. And mm-hmm. so many of these stories and these cases happen. And and look, we're still trying to deal with it. I mean, they and there's always been envelopes getting passed under the table. And you know what I mean? And <laughs> look, they took Reggie Heisman away because they bought his family a house or something. You know, and it's like, give hey, that hey. man Heisman back, please. That was the last time USC was good. If they don't give that man his Heisman back, like, get out of here. Well, and Eric Dickerson, the joke on him was he was playing football at SMU, which got the death penalty, which you don't, if that was when their program was basically shut down for two or three years. Eric Dickerson joked that he was, he actually took a pay cut to go to the NFL. 
because he was getting so much under the table. He had a gold. He had a gold Trans Am. He drove around on campus, and it was yeah. It was no yeah. secret. No secret. Not but do at you all. see? But do you see that? Is that a challenge right now that you're seeing? I know we were just talking about this from yeah. the collegiate side, but is this something that's bleeding into esports and gaming as a challenge with some young people? Uh, I, I think potentially. I think so. And it's just about the regulation of it, you know, and I think that's an area that esports can help in educating the, the audience and just, you know, the general public on how these things are regulated, right? So it's like in collegiates, we have the NCAA, which is probably in five to 10 years going to be totally dismantled because of this. Yeah, gone. Conferences are already trying to leave, you know, like the Big 12 and stuff, but I digress. But so with esports, the regulation of like how is there a governing board what's how are these things kind of the ownership and the the inner workings of it as an organizational right thing that could help trying to understand or how to help the audience and the general public understand like the inner workings of these types of things and how finances are put um are kind of dispersed and contracts and those types of things but even also i mean the brand sponsors that come in for the individual players is enormous and we're seeing so many professional athletes in their off time be able to go in esports and just play and then have their own Twitch channels and, and being able to have an additional stream of revenue going on. Kyle Long did this before he unretired from the Chicago Bears. You know, how his son, one of his sons that played, um, and he had a bunch of injuries and he was off. He wasn't playing for a couple of years. And so he started a Twitch channel and he was making damn near his regular salary in the NFL, just gaming in the off season when he had his foot up because he had, you know, a knee issue or whatever. And so it just shows how dispersed and how uncontemporary education can be, right? And how you can learn in all these other different spaces from either a financial standpoint, but then also just the mechanisms of like of how we learn mm -hmm. and how we make meaning, the opportunities that are provided in collaboration, the gamification of these types of things is is huge. And the potential is the potential warrants us to look into that. And it behooves us to look into like how we can it like it's like take take the current landscape of it. Okay. Do an audit and look at what works. Then figure out on the next column, why do these things work? Now apply that why they work into your space. So that's how you not copy and paste something, but you just audit it and to really pull out and extract the, the concepts or the features that make it successful. And that's what you can apply into your own business from a brand player education standpoint and then put your own ingredients and recipe on that and boom, then you can be, you know, that's a way that you can really start to look into working in the space sincerely. Well, and, and that's important too, what you say, look at an audit, not just as you said, copy and paste, because even with esports programs, I tell people, none of this is a turnkey solution. What I do here doesn't necessarily work there. You're also saying it's an audit. And that what you mean by that is critically looking at it from does this even fit into what I'm doing? Like, what, let's take funding, for example. Some people are totally fine taking funding in the esports space from those who deal in booze and weed. Right. Because there's a lot of that money now flowing into these spaces. Sure. But you may not be OK with that. You're your you're constituent, you know, in schools, we're not taking weed money. We're not taking, you know, beer money to to mm -hmm. run our esports. At least I hope we're not. Yeah. Uh, though, <laughs> I know there's some. There's some there's some there are some orgs, though, who are very shh about what how they are funded, which we also have to be mindful of. But you're yeah. absolutely right about that, about the audit, the actual like break it down. It what critical. does this really mean? It has to be critical. Yeah, you got to do that. And that's where you can start to not only reveal opportunities of growth, but then also where some challenges are, where some pain points are and then start to really answer and dig into why are those why are those challenges what other resources do you need where where can you glean to get support and insight for these types of things and really also just focusing again like on the human experience of this and taking it from the seat of the player the organization the teacher the brand the, the sponsor so once you have because all of those will have different intentions mm -hmm. right and so yeah that audit is critical 
and should be done quarterly, if not, you know, more regularly. So that at least you're at least keeping up, you know, and you're not leaving anything or anyone, God forbid, behind. Well, and that's, of uh, course, with esports, that's been my bugaboo is that even where you're seeing the placement of some of these uh, land land centers, arenas, they're they're, yeah. being, they're being put in areas where there's kids probably have better equipment at home than what yeah. you're even putting in the land center. And and I, I get that you have, you're a business and you have to make a profit, but also you're not going to make a profit in necessarily in some of these areas where there's high wealth, because, again, if they can get it better at home, why are they walking out the door? But yeah. I can think of I can think of some of the community areas around my own community where a gaming space is the only space where some of these kids can get some of these experiences. And right. Play. And that's unfortunate because it's a privilege. You know, it's a privilege to be able to be an artist. It's a privilege to be able to, you know, work in VR or be able to have a headset. And it's a privilege to be able to play games and these types of things. And so recognizing that, how can, what can we do to, to correct it? to make it more accessible, to make it more inclusive, you know, because, you know, especially, you know, speaking from, you know, a black experience and, 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 and predominantly black and brown communities where there is not a lot of wealth, there is not a lot of community resources that are safe mm -hmm. and are up to speed on technology and internet access and those types of things. It's kids and everyone, we all, we prioritize things. It's value, right? And especially as just a general consumer experience, like if you have one bad, you taste something bad and you're not gonna try it again, right? Mm -hmm. You put on a headset, it makes you dizzy or puke, you're not gonna try it again. So it's, happen. right? And so you go to a bad, like you said, one of these one of these centers that isn't up to speed and you're like, eh, I have better stuff at home, that's a why bother. And so you can't criticize that user for not wanting to come back because would you like we have to put ourselves in this that's why i keep saying like this whole people business things it's really we overcomplicate things yeah i i, I agree really do because the questions we have to ask are just simple like like the conversation that we are having like these are easy things that we have to just answer but it's it's the doing it authentically and honestly, you know, because we have to remove the ego. I think too many of us have that. And it was like, no, no, yeah, everything's fine. Yeah. But if <laughs> we have to, we have to remove that sometimes and just really get sincere and answer real straight questions. What, uh, what do you, what are you most curious about right now or researching at this time? What's, what's got you really just kind of like got your eyebrow raised? If you can do that, I can. I couldn't. I, I couldn't do this until I started teaching. You know, I'm fascinated by the NFTs and the digital currency space right now, and like the digital mm -hmm. collectibles and tokens. That's something I've got my eye on because I keep seeing, you know, the Tom Brady's and the NFLs and the UFCs and everyone getting involved in this. And I'm happy about it. I just am curious about the sustainability of it. Mm -hmm. and these digital tokens and i again per our last points i'm thinking of myself as a fan first like would i buy this and the thing about fandom is we want to showcase it as much as possible right so if i can't have it on a frame in my living room so anyone that comes in and be like hey look, remember that or so if i can't do like this and show someone then it's it's not really it's it's not of as much value or as token, you know what I mean? So I'm thinking about how, like the distribution of it and how NFTs will work in that space. I'm also just always keeping a pulse on, you know, what we kind of call like black Twitter and the subcultures and, and sub categories and genres and hubs that we have within larger digital spaces, because mm -hmm. I love it. I'm fascinated by it. And it's just funny how we can have one thing, right? Like Twitter. But that's the beauty of, of people and communities. Like we will make a space for ourselves out of something that wasn't intended to, which is fine at the end of the day, because they don't know how to talk to us. They don't know how, like that's why each community is different. I teach a community psychology course, if you couldn't tell. So <laughs> being able to have a place for ourselves within a larger space, I absolutely love because then it speaks to our own culture and it's spoken in a way that's like, yes, I'm talking to 
somebody else that would and if you don't know this then it probably wasn't meant for you you know and so which it's fine because we all don't have to be for everyone Mm -hmm. a brand isn't always for everyone you know and this is only something i even personally started to understand for myself and it's like i don't want everyone to like me anymore i'm okay with that (laughs) I used well, to have the biggest birthday parties, and if, if the cops didn't come, then it was it was wild. <laughs> but now I am quality over quantity, and I think people and brands need to start thinking about that too. And so I'm fascinated about how these digital spaces and stuff, and even our tokens and our the things that we put value and currency on, like trading cards coming back, and now the digital versions. I'm fascinated about how that could be translated into these other spaces. Well, let's 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 talk about one of these spaces that I think you really kind of created. Now, believe wow. it or not, you are not the first female hockey player I have talked to on my podcast. You're the well, second. I can't skate. I am not a player. I cannot. Well, skate. <laughs> we'll say we'll say hockey uh, enthusiast. Okay, that works. Um, the first one was Gamer Doc, but the I want to ask you because when we think hockey, we don't think African American. And we don't think female a lot of times, especially if you're just a, you know, female hockey is wonderful as it is. Camry Granado, who is one of the she was uh, very popular in the Chicago area and her, her brother, Tony, played for the Sharks and played for the Blackhawks. Um, but you don't think black girl hockey and you are the president of the black girl hockey league. Why? <laughs> well, yeah. First of all, for those of you who don't know about hockey, first off, it is the most expensive sport you could possibly play. ever play. Yeah. It's like just just to get this basic setup, you need like three grand just to. It, it is. It is. God forbid you're a kid, and you keep growing, and then yeah, just times that by every growth spurt that right. you know kid has. So it's insane. Um, but yes, Black Girl Hockey Club. Uh, I'm, I'm honored and blessed to be the president on their board of directors, and our founder and executive director, Renee Hess. Um, fellow IE Riverside, California girl like myself, but it started as a tweet, started as a tweet, turned into a movement and a nonprofit organization doing a hell of a lot of great work. And back in, I think it was like 2018 or so, she was in Dallas and was getting ready to see a stars game or something and just casually tweeted from herself, her own account. And just like, Hey, there any, you know, any black girls want to get together and watch the game, meet up somewhere. And Sure enough, someone was like, oh, too bad, I'm in Philly. Anybody want to see the Stars game? Oh, hey, I'm in Winnipeg. It was like, oh, man, I'm in Detroit. Like, oh, I'm in L.A., go King. So it just, it was just one of those like, hmm. And she happened to be going to, I think she was in like Comic-Con in San Diego or something and met up with Blake Bolden, who's amazing, uh, great leader and, and, and pioneer in this space and uh, only pro black, only black woman pro scout in the league and she's playing she works for the the los angeles kings and she mentioned it to blake and was like so i'm thinking about starting this uh, this thing i don't know what to do but black girl hockey club what do you think and she was like yes i wish i had this oh my god yes do it do it cut to 2019 i see a tweet from black girl hockey club like hey we're gonna do a meetup in la when the vegas golden knights are in town to play the kings anybody want to come this is where we're gonna be and i raised my eyebrow i had like nah this is (laughs) there's no freaking way so i was like i'll play your reindeer games i show up totally skeptical like there's no way at 10 a.m outside la live there was 50 people already deep wearing black girl hockey club stuff Black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, gay, straight, handicapped, blind, everything, old, young, babies, grandparents. And it was the most diverse (laughs) collection of people I'd ever seen in my life, let alone at a hockey event. And I was like, sold. I need to work with y'all immediately. Mm -hmm. And kept in touch and fast forward. Now I'm, I'm the president on their board. And we have been doing just such amazing, meaningful work. And it's one of the things that I continually try and echo, control what you can control. Mm -hmm. Because the mission of Black Girl Hockey Club is to make hockey more welcoming and inclusive for black women, our friends, our family, and our allies on and off the ice. Because many of us have had horrible experiences. We talked about this backstage before we got started about the toxicity that is associated with hockey culture. Mm -hmm. Gross. Bro culture, ew. And 
I myself have experienced a lot of it. You know, I went to a, a Sharks game when I was in college in the Bay Area, and I've been to Kings games, Ducks games, and I haven't been to Vegas yet now that I live here. But I get that that snake eyes, you know, when people look at you like, mm-hmm. you know, and I get the why are you, you're a hockey fan as I'm sitting down enjoying my beer or something. And when I bartended in L.A., I'd put a game on during, you know, during the playoffs or something. And they're like, what are you putting, what are you watching that for? That's not for you. Stop that. And this is coming from other black people sometimes mm-hmm. because there are just, there's that whole long narrative and that stigma. And that's what we're here to, to, to break down and dismantle because if I want to like, if I want to watch the game, I, we're allowed to watch the game. And so, and it's holding everyone, it's trying to do our best to serve us and to serve others to make sure that we're not, we're not feeling dismissed or overlooked or weird for liking something we should be able to like it and so it's romantic to think like oh i'm gonna end racism like no one else has ever done <laughs> right good yeah. good luck right or i'm gonna end world hunger by thursday well i want us to control what we can control and what we have done and controlled is a scholarship program where three times a year we give thousands of dollars away to black girls who play hockey internationally we've given away Thousands we have, and actually August 31st is um, the deadline for um, our fall scholarship. So I'll make sure I give this to you so that we can share it to folks. You can nominate yourself or nominate a young black girl who's playing hockey anywhere. We've given away, last term, I know we gave one to um, a wonderful, wonderful player in Kenya. Um, mm. We've all, it's international. I don't think, I don't think hockey in Kenya at all. And the Kenyan Ice Lions are there, baby. Let me tell you, like they will skate circles all around all of us. And it's well, beautiful. But they're so, everywhere. We're everywhere. The parallels with this and what we're facing right now, a lot of kids in esports. Yeah. A lot a lot of girls who just show up and just be like, well, either they'll say this isn't for me or they're looking for a different experience. Or this is the experience they want, but they're but they're chastised because they're a girl in a space that's predominantly white male or white yeah. cis male or Asian male. I mean, yeah, that, the, the, the parallels here are tremendous. Absolutely. And it's one of the things that we've noticed. There are a lot of other fans and girls that didn't feel com- confident enough or comfortable speaking out right as a gamer or as a hockey fan. And. Fair, I know I grew up blessed in having a a wonderful family that has given me my voice and my confidence. And I know that's not something that everyone has, right? You mean you didn't get this last week? You sound like you just (laughs) got (laughs) it. But it's one of those things that like, if you aren't comfortable and if somebody harasses or says something to you, just tag me and I'll do it for you. So (laughs) that's why we're a community. And we have each other's backs. And I also recognize that in giving our scholarships away three times a year, it's part of it is also just making that space that's good for us, right? So we have a lot of digital events where we do a lot of self-care. We have a book a book club. We're going to hopefully go back to in-person meetups um, hope this next upcoming season, but also to change the off the ice part. I started, um, one of the things that I, I really wanted to do, and I'm, I'm so happy that we were able to launch this just last month in July, was our leadership and development program within Black Girl Hockey Club because the work that needs to be done in terms of inclusion, that's not just on the ice, right? That's journalism, social media, marketing, broadcast, refereeing, hockey operations. Maybe you want to do any of these, any and all of these things in hockey, but don't have that means to. So we've created this program to instill mentorships. And so we have two wonderful mentors and we have two wonderful mentees and that are, and you can be of any age for this as well. And we have Shireen Ahmed and who runs with one of the, um, the Burn It Down Sports Podcast, which is amazing. And she's just a fantastic uh, Muslim woman and sports feminist and advocate in, in Canada. And then we also have an executive for the San Jose Sharks who is mentoring, who's mentoring um, some of our folks right now that have applied. And so it's just beautiful that we're able to instill these because like, hey, maybe you can't skate like me, but you're also a hockey fan and want to be involved in this as a profession. We know it takes a village and that relationships are everything. So this, I was very, very honored and proud to to be a part of that launch just last month and it's ongoing right now. Um, And yeah, that's just some of the work that, you know, we're doing. And those are things that we can control that help serve our values and making sure that hockey at least the past is the past, but we can only look forward and make and do our part in making sure that it's better than it was before. 
And again, if you're if you're hearing this, a lot of times you can take that word, you know, hockey and replace it with esports. And I think there's a, again, there's a ton of parallels here. So if you're not finding what it is that you're looking for in your own corner of the world, you know, sometimes a tweet, as you said, Dr. Singleton, a tweet can make it happen or you know reach out to that one person you go how would i do this here and that again starts the whole conversation because when i hear you say when i hear you say hey the san jose sharks have an executive who's now working with your group that's about as top as you can get i mean very much so yeah yeah. and we we hope to only continue growing this and we're these mentorships are lasting six months because i don't want it to feel like that one and done hey i let you on a business call but i muted you the whole time sayonara no this is this is a very meaningful relate ongoing relationship that I want um, our mentees to be able to have and walk away with. And per your point, this the parallels are insane. And it's one of those things where people just have to speak up. And if you see an opportunity to to be of service and, and improve things, like you said, for, for girls and women of color in esports, who's doing the work? Like identify that landscape, who's doing the work. And if there ain't someone doing it or doing it right, then you do it. Because innovation, that is what innovation is. It's not anything crazy where there's like beakers and blue liquid and smoke coming out of it and tubes everywhere like chemists and Frankenstein. I think innovation is as simple as recognizing where there's a problem and filling that need. Mm -hmm. It's that easy. It's where's their problem? Where is there a gap? What needs to be done? And doing it. Because it all started again, like as that tweet, and it just became a ha. Huh, other people have the same shared experience. Nobody's doing this. So Renee said, damn it, and did it herself. And I'm happy and blessed to be there working with her and just keep growing this and definitely help and consult with others that are looking to make that make those types of, you know, civic changes for folks because it's worth it. Right. I, I, and I agree with you. And again, even though I really promote esports as a way to connect with kids, I know that there are some kids who they, their passion is going to be found somewhere else. And sometimes they don't even know what their passion is until you say, hey, have you tried this? And yeah, yeah. hockey is, is you know, if you're a kid in Canada and you grow up and three years old, you're on skates and you're able to cut and everything. That's cool. But uh-huh. when you're 17 and it's like, I've never set foot on the ice, but I th- think this is really cool. Yeah, there's where are you going to get that support, especially if it's not something that's popular in your neighborhood or in your area? Right. Right. Or, yeah, and it's not been traditionally promoted for you, you know, like, hey, you should do this. You should do that, you know, so yeah. definitely, most definitely. So as we're, uh, as we're starting to wrap up, um, boy, this has been a thick conversation. There's a lot in here. Uh, as part of uh, making experiences for young people better through collaboration, is there an organization or person doing great things in your field that you'd like us to give a shout out to? Oh, uh, um, I would shout out again, Shireen Ahmed, um, at, at Twitter, it's, oh, I will look it up because she's amazing. It, she's fantastic. And she has been doing just great, great work. Um, it is at Shireen underscore Shireen Ahmed underscore. So as I said, she's a sports activist and, and host, is one of the co-hosts for the Burn It Down podcast. Um, here i will send this to you because she yeah. she's been doing fantastic work and in in canada so she's always been um on tsn and, and up there and just always also speaking honestly about all of the you know social justice and and community issues so as a muslim woman she is always very prominent and speaking about like other um the attacks and and within the Afghan community and other marginalized people. So she's been doing fantastic work and I would definitely subscribe and look up anything that she has written because it will blow your mind and listen to the burn it down podcast. That is fantastic. I just looked up her thing and I'm just like, Oh, she is somebody I need to talk to. She's amazing. Yes. And she keeps it real and and she always makes me laugh and she's, uh, yeah, like I said, she's one of our mentors for black girl hockey club and a volunteer. Um, and, her podcast is fantastic as well, and she just does such amazing work and thinks outside the box as well. Any final thoughts for this week? 
Anything that we've forgotten? I think we've we've covered so much. Covered a lot, and I know we could keep going and going. You have your own podcast. I do have my And own. I'm going to be a guest on that podcast here in like 10 minutes. You are. I know. So we can keep it going. Yeah. <laughs> and um, no, I just want to thank you um, and really, really thank you and applaud you for using your space for this and, and recognizing that so much better can be done all across the board. You know, and it's up to us to be able to use our resources, our perspective, our insight to better the situation because it's it can be gross outside, you know, and it, it's not all it's not always fun. It's not. And I don't ever I don't want to a lot of people get surprised when I say like, yes, I get depressed and I have anxiety sometimes. And they're like, what? You? Huh? You're just always so mad. And I was like, yeah, that we talked for 30 minutes, but there's. 23 and a half other hours where I have to deal and a lot of things are not great um so being a support is is always very very important and having friends and being able to just reach out and know that there is somebody thinking of you and stuff and so I I instantly I remember we were on that other conference together and Mm -hmm got connected in, in a room and we were like, Oh, me and you do me and you like, we have to connect. And, and, and you, you stayed true and promised to that. And so I, I just think and applaud you for, for being a resource, for being there and, and helping continue these types of conversations and, and understanding the human element within all of this, because that's sometimes really overlooked and people think that everyone's just glossy all the time, but doing what we can to better, to create some fun, because like I said, there's a lot of gross out there. So, but anything that we can do to make a fun moment during a hockey game, or dis, or unplugging for a while and getting into a, a, an esports game and just being with a community, sometimes that's the highlight of people's days, and we can't overlook that. Well, we are a lot. Even though, again, your focus is maybe one thing and mine maybe another, we realize that we're helping out the marginalized. We're helping out those kids who sometimes just don't can't find their others. Uh, we're we're allies connected. in this. Definitely, definitely connected. There's so much intersections between all of this. Cause, yeah, it's it's never just one thing. Well, Dr. Tanisha Singleton, host of the uh, – what's your podcast again for everybody? I Have sorry. Questions podcast. I Have Questions podcast. Yeah, sorry. I remember the – the I it was I H I Q. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. That was <laughs> that was coming across. Thank you for being a guest today on the Academy of Esports podcast. Thank you for having me. That will do it for this week on the Academy of Esports. I've been your host, James O'Hagan. Esports are organized competitive video games allowing schools to redefine their athletic culture, diversify opportunities for student participation, promote good physical and mental health, increase collegiate scholarship pathways, and play games. We can never forget the importance of play. The mission of the Academy of Esports is to support these ideals. The vision of the Academy of Esports is for all students to experience the fun and joy of playing competitive video games. You may follow me on Twitter, at Jim O'Hagan. That's at J-I-M-O-H-A-G-A-N. And through the Academy of Esports account, at T-A-O Esports. It's a great way to get the latest blog posts, podcast episodes, and news coming out of esports and education. And remember, you can continue your engagement by going to www.taoesports.com. You can also connect through Facebook at www.facebook.com slash taoesports. Thanks again for listening, and I look forward to our time again next week.